Arctic Star Exploration, operated by a team of proven mine finders, is focused on diamonds in Finland and the Northwest Territories of Canada. A work program is planned for our Finland property that contains diamond-bearing kimberlite. Arctic Star trades on the TSX Venture Exchange, symbol ADD, and the Frankfurt Exchange, symbol 82A1. Please visit our website at arcticstar.ca or call us at 604-689-1799. You're listening to HowStreet.com Radio, available online at TalkDigitalNetwork.com. Welcome to HowStreet.com Radio, the online source for market opinions. Here is Jim Goddard. My guest is home ownership consultant Ross Kay from the TheWealthyHomeowner.ca. Welcome back to the show, Ross. Thanks for having me back, Jim. If you cruise around the Internet, you keep seeing all these articles and guides available to assist buying a home. CMHC, the Canadian Real Estate Association, and almost every mortgage broker and bank has their own version of such a guide. Which of the guides would you recommend our listeners to use to get ready to buy? Hmm. Uh, none, and I, I'm not uh, I'm not being uh, smart here when I make that comment. Uh, the guides over the years, Jim, have been developed to assist real estate agents uh, to sell homes. That's what those guides have all been designed under. Um, I don't know if you if you've checked recently the, uh, the CMHC guide. So I think most Canadians would accept that CMHC guide should should be the the one guide they should be able to go to for an unbiased opinion uh, whether they should buy or not, um, and what is the best process to follow when looking to buy a home. Uh, the CMHC guide up until last year was filled with recommendations of using a realtor. It was filled with recommendations about the Canadian Real Estate Association, and it was filled with recommendations um, about uh, getting your guidance from someone who licensed the realtor trademark. That's all the word realtor is, by the way, folks. It's simply a trademark that you pay to license. There is no level of service associated with that trademark at all. You join the Canadian Real Estate Association, you pay your dues, to get to you. Well, CMHC um, this year, earlier this year, when they produced their 2017 guide, because they update these regularly, um, I was finally able to get them to remove every reference from the Canadian Real Estate Association and the word realtor out of that guide. So for the last 25 years, the guides they produced all included the recommendation of using a realtor and the Canadian Real Estate Association. This is the very first time where that guide is that that guide has been produced, they didn't even realize what they were doing with those guides. They didn't even realize that they were promoting certain licensed to trade practitioners, sales reps, in the country, and they were not recommending other equally and well des equally deserving and licensed sales reps um, who didn't who chose not to license the realtor trademark. They didn't even realize they were making that mistake. Well, I'll tell you, those those references are now all gone with the 2017 guy. Um, whether it was a threat of lawsuit or it was it was uh, embarrassment, as most of their metrics have been challenged over the last uh, three years, that's changed too. All of the bank guides that you see out there, they're only designed to get you to deal with that bank to secure a mortgage. They so want Ross, you to do that Ross going you... back, Ross going back to the CMAC guide. So is that a, a good guide now or a better one? No. No. So they they removed they removed the recommendations about using realtors and getting your in other words letting your realtor drive the process. Uh but they've gone back in and they haven't really they haven't changed the guide uh to reflect what any home buyer should think about when buying a home, even whether or not they should buy a home or not or how the process has changed from when the first guide was written. What I mean by that is, Jim, the guides today are the exact same guides that were available in the 1980s. They have not changed. Uh, the recommendations, the advice in them is exactly the same. Yet, at the same time, the home selling infrastructure across Canada, MLS rules and regulation, real estate trading laws, um, Tools that are available for a home buyer, um, building inspectors, home inspectors, um, insurance provision, 
all of those items have drastically changed since when I started selling real estate in the 80s, yet none of those changes are reflected in the guide. The guides don't reflect the cost of owning a home. They never even talk about it. Now, the CMHC guide does give some workbooks and some, some sheets, worksheets that you can download and work your way through. But without someone sitting there telling you how to work your way through it, um, they're really, they're really limited in their use. Better than nothing, but limited in their use. What, it, what your listeners need to understand is this. When you start down the path of home ownership, it's probably going to last you 40 to 50 years. If you're in your 30s, you're going to be a homeowner at least 40 to 50 years. Over that period of time, the decisions you make on and off over the course of those 40 to 50 years are going to have huge ramifications going forward. People who are involved in the Wealthy Homeowner Buyer Program for the sake of the argument, if you're going to buy using the program, and you're, and you're 30 years old, your entire next 50 years is mapped out for you. Um, it's laid out pro with probably how you're going to trade homes, what the cost is to make those trades, how much money you're going to lose on each trade, ways th that you don't have to uh, lose money during those trades. You're going to account for how interest rates are probably going to evolve over the, over the next 25 to 30 years. And each one of those little tiny changes um, makes a big difference to where you should be guided in what you should be doing today with buying a house. I'm asked, Ross, is today a, a good date? Is is now a good time to buy a house? The real estate boards are all telling us right now there's a lull in the market. This is a great time to, to buy. Or if we don't buy now, the housing prices and condominiums are going to jump up so much that uh, we're not going to be able to catch up. What I say is, if you were talking last November, interest rates were one point. 99%. If you're talking today, interest rates are at 3%. If you understand how home ownership math works, and this is something that does not appear in any of these guides, and, and that just blows my mind that these simple principles are not in books, but they're not there. The, that move of interest rate of 1% had huge consequences over over your lifetime of ownership. What happens in the next year when interest rates go up another half or three quarters of a percent, assuming the economy is not wiped out because of the housing market? What is that going to change in how you should be looking at home ownership? People think, think it's just a monthly payment. The monthly payment, people, only is a number that's important to the bank. How much, what is the maximum the bank can encourage you to take out in the form of a mortgage. That changes drastically from when interest rates were 1.99% last November, that was what our best wealthy homeowner rate was, to what they are today, which is about 2.89%. It is a massive difference, yet none of these guys have it, Jim. So, a timely question. Um, we know for our own uh, members when they're buying, it's, no, it's one of the, another one of the reasons why our programs don't cost anything, uh, because the savings that you make by using the program, you know, are ten times more than what uh, the programs end up uh, costing you. Um, and and this type of information does need to be out in the hands of the public. I'm battling with that decision daily. Uh, there does need to be a guide with some guidance out there that contrasts uh, the narrative that everybody else has. has. Um, but as of right now, uh, there is not a guide out there that I can recommend. Well, Ross, I guess this is a perfect opportunity for you to publish one, isn't it? Well, the, the thing is, I publish it, and then, you know, it's, it's like our we come on this show, you know, I, I want to be free free with some of your listeners. I, 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 want, I want them to get value from listening to your show. And a, a week later, I see a real estate website, a blogger, someone else trying to uh, figure out real estate analytics, guessing what I was saying on your show, and uh, trying to make their own version of it. Um, some of these people, Jim, were invited by CMHC to go give a presentation at the Housing Symposium, symposium the CMHC held in October. 
Now, I wouldn't go to those housing symposiums because I would have to give course after course after course to those economists sitting there to show them what I'm talking about. Um, so if I'm to talk about a guide, I can put out information, but that information can be used to harm homeowners, harm home buyers. It can be used for the own self-interest of a real estate agent, for the sake of the argument, or a bank. They could say, oh, well, the Wealthy Homeowners Program suggests that you purchase your home in this month because you're buying this category of home, and this is where the listing inventory peaks, and this means the best time for you to buy. So that's what we're recommending uh, that you do now. Now, what I just told you, no one in the real estate industry has ever talked about. Google it. Go ahead, Google it. You won't find it. People say, what is the best time of the house for us for me to buy a home? Well, it depends on the category of home you're buying, folks. It depends on which municipality in Canada you're buying, folks. It depends on which community in Canada that you're buying, folks. And none of this information can come from a realtor. Realtors say, talk to your realtor for lo local advice. You have never heard anywhere that it depends on the category of home you're interested in buying that determines what time of the year generally is the best time to buy it. There are, with, within, a, real estate doesn't work in a calendar year, as I've told your listeners here over and over again. There is a trading cycle. And within the trading cycle, there are trading periods. Generally speaking, over the last 40 years, trade, there have been two trading periods within each trading cycle. So right now, we're in the only one ever to go five trading periods. So there have been five opportunities since May of 2013, depending on the category of home that you're buying. Again, I got to be careful, depending on which province, which municipality, what was happening in those, those locations. But each of those all areas all had the same pattern. And those patterns are, are not calendar year based. Although and, the real estate associations tell you they are. I, I know. That's why they use the seasonal adjustment. And, and, and if I sat down with any mathematician or statistician and showed them how, how the trading cycle works, they would understand that you can't seasonally adjust a housing market that is run from May of 2013 all the way through till t the end of 2016 for the first time in history that it's it's ran it's run for that long of a period of time. So if that's and none none of the trading cycles in the previous forty years were exactly the same. Some were similar, but they weren't exactly the same. Those trading cycles are impacted by interest rate changes. An interest rate change changes the trading cycle. That gets misread by all of these people you read in the newspaper. You heard about Sales are going to surge this fall because the OSFI has changed the mortgage route and buyers are going to rush in before the rates rise. And I would say hogwash. Show me one piece of data that corroborates your, 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 your suggestion. There is not, correlation does not mean causation. I fell into the trap for a long period of time thinking that everyone realized this. They don't. If you're going to use a home buyer's guide, and it, the very first question, one of the very first questions it asks you, what category of home are you buying? What market you're buying on? And then magically, if they created some chart, which is impossible, because trading cycles don't, and trading periods don't follow the calendar year, um, they could tell you which, which, uh, which, uh, 60 day window is the best time for you to buy a house. Do it. But other than that, don't listen to the guides because they're all hogwash. They're all designed for the stakeholders. They're not designed for the home buyer. Every single metric that is released to the public is for the home seller. Average selling price. The average selling price is not the average selling price. It's called the average purchase price. It's how much buyers are able to pay. That's why when interest rates rise, the average purchase price drops. Now, there will be a delay between the drop and that price as people are watching out in Vancouver. What you watched out in Vancouver was you had the surge in condo sales. Because when they brought the foreign buyer tax in, how it rolled over in the market, 
all you've got 12 to 18 months of data that has all been skewed now. It's useless because you don't know how to adjust it. We can adjust the data because we know how the trading period and the trading cycle impacts the data and the changes to interest rates, foreign buyer tax, um, the amount of GDS you're allowed, all those sort um, the advent of your uh, home buyer plan. All of those things made little changes that need to be adjusted for so you understand what the underlying value of your homes are. This is how we tell everyone, look folks, in Vancouver, your underlying value is still about 30% below where it was at market peak. That's the truth. I can't do a guy, Jim, that shows all of that because it's not cyclical. You can't predict. You, or, excuse me, I can predict and forecast with 100 percent degree of accuracy. What I'm saying is you can't say the same thing's going to happen year after year after year. So the guide really should be designed for the individual home buyer. So when people enroll in the wealthy homer buying program, they have a guide that's created just for them. Yes, they have to go through and answer some questions. They have to go through a couple of um, a couple of uh of pro not programs, they have to go through a couple of uh, assessments so that we know what what is in their best interest um, based on reviewing thousands of real estate transactions over the last forty years, and then we plug that those the, that um, home buying profile into our metrics, which tells them where they should be looking at and what they're going to buy. the The reason for that is. Although home prices may fall, if interest rates rise disproportionately to how the housing prices fall, which always happens the same way as it does in the way when interest rates are dropping, house prices take a while to catch up. As everybody in Canada watched over the last two years, that's how long it took to, before those lower interest rates finally showed up in average selling prices, which are average purchase prices, meaning I can take up more mortgage because because the interest rate has fallen and I still qualify now I qualify for a lot more money so I'll spend it um, all of those items Jim have to be included in a, in in your, your guidance uh, in terms of buying a house maybe that's where I, what I should say I, I guess really there's someone should create a home buying guidance manual um, what I would say is is that uh, we are training um, we are training people right now so that they can understand some of these factors and so that uh, we are able to offer our programs on a larger basis. I mean, we're, we're we, right now, Jim, um, when people are going through the profiles uh, in, in our memberships, uh, we're having to, to decline because we we are only taking a, a certain type of, of a new member on right now. Um, we have to be very careful that we can deliver the services that those people do. We'll have more with Ross K. right after the break. Hi, I'm Douglas Mason, President and CEO of Magnum Gold Corp. Inc., MGI on the TSX Venture Exchange. A 2015 drill program on the LH property intersected high-grade gold, including 16.9 meters of 13.58 grams and 11 meters of 20.66 grams per ton gold. A follow-up drill program is planned to further evaluate previously identified subsurface high-grade gold mineralization. Please visit our website at magnumgoldcorp.com. Hi, I'm Douglas Mason, President and CEO of Rainy Mountain Royalty Corp, RMO on the TSX Venture Exchange. Rainy Mountain's Brunswick property is located in the Ridout Shear Zone in Ontario, with grab samples running as high as 32 grams per tonne gold. A follow-up drill program to test the numerous targets located by recent groundwork will commence later this year. Please visit our website at rmroyalty.com. Welcome back. We're speaking with Ross K. Ross, last week, the Real Estate Board of Greater Vancouver said sales increased 7% on October versus September, while the Toronto Real Estate Board was saying sales in Toronto were up 12% on October versus September, and they both claimed things were getting better. What does your analysis of those markets suggest? Thank you. Fantastic question, Jim. Fantastic question. Um, your listeners really need to listen very carefully right now to understand 
the hogwash the real estate boards have given you over the last 40 years. Both real estate boards leading article in their press releases in the first paragraph were that sales in, Oct in October were up over sales in September. They bragged about that fact. And that is truthful. Yes, in both markets, the number of homes sold by the members of their real estate boards were up both in Vancouver and for the Toronto, Vancouver Real Estate Board and the Toronto Real Estate Board. But now here's where the difference happens. Toronto said their sales were up 12%. Vancouver said their sales were up 7 Now, here's the truth. Year over year, Toronto sales were down 26%. Year over year, sales were down 26%. In Vancouver year over year, sales were up 35%. So 30 plus 35% year over year in October in, in Vancouver, minus 26% in Toronto, yet both real estate boards claimed an increase of only 7 or 12%. A little tiny, a little tiny difference between what they claim. Your listeners need to also understand is, Toronto Real Estate Board released their data last Wednesday. They never released their real estate data before the Real Estate Board of Greater Vancouver does. The public and the press needs to understand this. Real Estate Boards across Canada act in aggregate with one another to optimize the opportunity to have a spin a positive number in one location if needed, to, to lessen the impact of a negative number being released in another part of the country. The Canadian Real Estate Association jumps on board, as does the British Columbia Real Estate Association, the Ontario Real Estate Association, the Association of Alberta. You have literally about 100 different real estate organizations which will strategically release monthly sales number to benefit the overall members of the Canadian Real Estate Board. And we have it on record right here in the month of October at the biggest level I have ever seen in real estate data. The, the Vancouver Real Estate Board said our sales have increased 7% October, uh, September over October. Toronto says ours have gone up 12%. What the focus wasn't on that Vancouver was up 35% and Toronto was down 26%. This goes to show you why a trading cycle is all powerful. The Vancouver Real Estate Board was comparing a, uh, the downward trend on a trading cycle, which happened as a result of uh, the fear of making a mistake that went on in Vancouver after the foreign buyer tax where sales had drastically dropped off last October. That is a short-term variable in your data that you need to adjust for. And then this October, all of a sudden, everybody realized it wasn't what they thought it was last year, and they're now they're buying a few more homes, and there's that 35% increase. For a 7% increase, 35% increase year over year, equaling a 7% increase September to October. But in Toronto, where there was a 12% increase September, October, there was a 26% decrease year over year October. That's because the Toronto real estate market was peaking last, their trading cycle was peaking last fall. And now you're reporting this falls against where the trough is coming against the peak of the last trough. Now, luckily for Canadians, what happened on this rare occasion is the trading cycles moved, the trading periods within the trading cycles moved at the same time in Vancouver and Toronto. And that is a rarity over the last 40 years. You have the, this one instance where you can download the two press releases from the two real estate boards. You can really, you can read how a 7% increase in September, October in Vancouver wasn't bragged about a 35% increase. 
that really happened year over year. And a 12% increase, in other words, Toronto Real Estate Board is inferring their sales have gotten better than Vancouver's did in October, covering up a 26% drop. Now, imagine being a home buyer out there right now who has one of those guides we talked about in the last segment, Jim, out there trying to buy a house and knowing what the heck am I supposed to do? You have no idea what you're supposed to do, folks. And the problem is, it's really straightforward, and it's re really very simple. And I believe you are intelligent enough to make that home buying, home selling, or home owning decision on your own, having the information in front of you. I believe you are smart enough to make the, the best decision for you and your family. Clearly, the real estate boards do not. And this manipulation of the public and the press, because not a single Google, again, folks, right after you get off listening to the show tonight, Google where the two real estate boards had this wide variance in their sales, um, in their sales between Vancouver and Toronto. You won't find it. You're going to find a notice of surging sales in Toronto, better than expected, um, good, a little bit better sales in Vancouver, uh, just what we expected. You're not going to see, wow, our, our sales have fallen through the floor. Wow, our sales have returned to last year. And then you're going to see the old 10-year comparable. So then they roll it over into the 10-year comparable. Well, why don't they roll it into the 20-year comparable? When they're talking about this is better than the average over the last 10 years, well, why don't you talk, why don't you say it's better than the average over the last 20 years? Why not the better than the average over the last 30 years? Why not? Better than the average over the last 40 years. Heck, why not? Let's go on a big string here and say it's better than the average over the last 100 years. Of course it's going to be better than the last 10 years. Do you not think there were a couple of million more homes in Canada than there were 10 years ago? That's how these real estate board folks con you folks. They look at a little tiny section of the market, which is their world. It's their it's their la la land. It's where they it's where they where they make their living. They exclude all the rest of the real estate market around uh, Canada. They don't even look at new homes. How new home sales impact resale home market. I, I watched on the news today, Jim. Um, headline: Montreal home sales were up, and I'm looking are, like, are you guys not? Listen, Pete. In Montreal, their sales chain is basically 3.8 links. In other words. If one house sells, it's going to get, end up being reported as a total of 3.8 homes being sold. Because A, sell, L, A sells A, A buys B, B buys C, C buys D. That's how the sales chain works. Each house gets more expensive as you move up the sales chain. Somewhere along that sales chain, people get out of the, out of the um, resale market, and some of those people enter the resale market. How those two markets intermingle impacts the average selling price, impacts how many homes are going to be sold, impacts what impact of what's going to happen with your local economy, impacts the illusion of house price change. Those things all interact together. So when I heard Montreal sales um, set a new record, I think, well, wait a second, folks. It's 55 more sales. I don't really think in a city with 2 million homes, that 55 extra sales is even worth talking about. But of course, 55 times 3.8, all of a sudden, it becomes over 200 extra sales. And now they think a 200% gain, oh, we get to report that as a 7% increase in our business. Rocket, racket, record sales in Montreal. People are making the largest financial decisions of their life based on these ridiculous, asinine comments from that appear in the in mainstream media over housing data. There are 3.8 links in the Montreal sales chain. We know that 55 new home buyers moved from the re, out of the resale market and bought brand new homes. That equals about 209 sales difference. So we should have saw an increase of 209 sales in October. We saw 213 folks. We were out by one. 
you need to start getting some realistic housing intelligence because you are going to be investing over $1 million of your income into your home. We'll have more with Ross K. right after this. Avon Resources Limited is a gold exploration company with significant projects in British Columbia, Saskatchewan, and the Yukon. Trading on the TSX Venture Exchange, symbol ABN, and the pink symbol ABN AF. Surrounded by world-class gold deposits and mines, Avon's 23,000 hectares Forest Kerr Gold Project is located in the heart of the Golden Triangle in northwestern BC. For more information, visit us at avonresources.com. Keep informed. Receive our weekly recap of thought-provoking articles, podcasts, and radio delivered to your inbox for free. Sign up for the HowStreet.com weekly recap on our homepage, HowStreet.com. Welcome back. We're talking with Ross K. Ross, mortgage rates have risen the last few months, and a listener was asking how those rising rates have impacted the markets across Canada and how the new mortgage rules will impact Vancouver. Okay. So I'll start with the second part of your question. How will these mortgage rules impact Vancouver? The OSFI brought these mortgage rules in specifically to target the Toronto and Vancouver housing market, which CMAC specifically has repeated over and over again are the two most overheated housing markets in Canada. Red warning, red warning, red warning, um, which is what they say in their book, red warning, red warning, red warning. Um, what the OSFI does not understand is the changes that the OSFI has made with mortgage lending is going to impact the city of Vancouver less than any other city in Canada. It is going to impact Toronto approximately fourth. There will be the fourth most fourth most unaffected because of this mortgage rule change. Places like Edmonton, Windsor, Sudbury, um, even Abbotsford, uh, Kelowna, they are going to be impacted by this rule more than Vancouver and Toronto. Yet you won't find this in print everywhere. Last week in your show, I talked about to you what this effectively is a, is a, is a variable GDS ratio. That's what the OSFI has done. Instead of cha- dropping the, the, uh, the, uh, GDS ratio, they brought this rule change in, which effectively dropped it and also allowed it to be mitigated because when you jump uh, a 1% interest rate drop increase today is not the same as a 1% interest uh, rate increase was back in 1990. When you're going from 2 to 3% interest, it's a huge jump. When you're going from 12, 11 to 12% interest rates, it's a very small jump. So that effect, this, this, this change effectively moves. It is variable with how interest rates change. Now, it's not as variable as it should be, um, but it, it still is going to mitigate that. So that in conjunction with where, what, where you live also has an impact by this mortgage rule change. And in Vancouver, it's going to impact them less than anywhere else. That's simply the truth. Now, am I going to tell you why it's going to impact them less? No, I'm not going to tell you that. Uh, There's a couple of black and white issues uh, why it's going to impact them and whether we choose to do this in a report to to blow the lid off this myth or not, I I haven't decided. But I do know that our members in in these communities they are already having their housing price forecasts adjusted differently. In other words, the members that are in Edmonton, we have already adjusted their forecasts to the impact of these rules, which will impact the market six to 12 months later in their forecast, because we know it impacts their market different than it does in Vancouver. We know that you can move literally. This is the honest truth, Jim. Like this is the honest truth. You can move one block in the city of Toronto. You can spend a million dollars one block away from the exact same house. So in other words, you could buy the exact same house except move it one block's distance. The OSFI rule change is going to drastically impact uh, who is able to buy that house one block away from another. And it's massive. 
Um, so when I hear these comments, will it impact Vancouver? Actually, this rule change in particular, this, this, this one rule change is going to impact Vancouver less than everywhere else. Still going to impact it. It's just going to impact it Vancouver less than every, everyone else. Um, and then depending on where you live, the rule will become more and more and more detrimental to home equity. In other words, housing prices are going to fall differently depending on what part of the market you're, the country you're living in. Ross, when it comes to BC foreign buyers, recent data released by the government showed some increase in foreign buyer activity. We see headlines suggesting foreign buyers are, have returned, yet you've remained silent about it. What is your opinion on this latest data release? Please, listeners, go back to Jim's show from back in uh, April and May and June and July of 2016 and listen to the shows where we reference foreign buyer tax and foreign buyers. Everyone is still has under this false belief that in June and July of 2016, 10 and 11 percent of all home sales were going to foreign buyers. Yet in August, it dropped to 2 percent. That is a myth, folks. What happened in June and July of last year was sales from August, sales that were set to close to foreign buyers in August, September, and October were pulled forward into July so you didn't have to pay the tax. As a matter of fact, there are homeowners, former owners, in Vancouver who sold their, were selling their homes to foreign buyers who were financially incentivized to move the closing dates forward. In other words, the foreign buyers' lawyers actually increased the selling price of the property to cover the any additional cost the homeowner would have for moving out early. When you when you adjust August, September, October, and a little tiny bit of November's to compensate for those sales that were moved forward into July, that should have been reported in August, September, October, November, but weren't, so they didn't have to pay the tax. They reported them in July. It's a level playing field right on through till now. Now, are you going to have a little bit of a bump in uh, in uh, in uh, July and August of this year versus January, February, and March? Of course you are, because there's going to be more home sales closed then. You also have to adjust for how bo foreign buyers buy their homes. They buy their homes in the spring. They're not coming into Vancouver and buying homes in the fall, which will close in January, February, March. They don't buy that way. They buy January, February, and March, April, and May, and those homes close June, July, July, August, September, October. Now, anybody questions my authority on this? Simply go to the Terranet National Bank House Price Index, download their data for Greater Vancouver, forget the pricing data, look at their adjusted sales pairs, and you're going to see what I'm speaking about right now is reflected in their sales pairs. And it also is why the Terranet National Bank House Price Index for Vancouver in June and July and August of last year continued on for a couple more months because of the way their methodology works, got skewed. And why they got caught. Because those more ultra-luxury class homes who had their sales moved back to July versus August, September, October of last year caused a surge in the price to be recorded. And it was misrepresented by every housing analyst, every economist, every mainstream media in Canada, and presented to the public as if it was something different. Oh, no, prices were still going up in July. No, they weren't. You simply had more of those ultra-luxury class, class home sales moved forward and closed until June and July. Because Terranet National Bank is a closed uh, metric. In other words, they measure house prices after they've closed, where the Canadian Real Estate Association measures them when they've sold, two totally different things. 
In other words, you sell your house, and then three or four months later, you clo- it closes, and the new buyer moves in. Turn that Mas- National Bank measures closed. Now, they also have some other problems with their methodology that screws it up even worse, but that's, that's one of the issues. It's why it lags the Canadian average selling price by between um, four and eight months, depending on where the trading cycle moves. So, have foreign buyer activity increased? No. It's exactly the same as when the foreign buyer tax impacted the market. It is, it is not changed at all. Now, that said, are foreign buyers circumventing the tax? Yes. Are foreign buyers still buying in Vancouver? Yes. And what your listeners should all be demanding from the local politicians in British Columbia. We want to know how many British Columbia homes are owned by foreign owners. We want that number. Those numbers are available at the land uh, land uh, transfer office, land titles office. Those numbers are available to be calculated. I could get in there with a, with a spreadsheet. I could download a spreadsheet for the last 30 years of data. I could ag- I could take from that spreadsheet a couple of data points, and I would know what the exact number of foreign owners of British Columbia real estate are. And I think that's where the main problem is here. The main problem is no government body has been brave enough to cross the owner divide. How many foreign owners own Vancouver real estate? Forget the buyers. This little 5% or 3% or 4% number that you hear, that's only on the sales that took place. Also, your foreign buyer data. They don't include new homes. Foreign buyers are buying brand new homes, condos, whatever, in Vancouver, and it's not being reported because that loophole was left in the data. So to compare, you can't because of that loophole was left there. People are simply guessing. That's all they're doing. They're guessing. They don't know how to adjust the data. And they Ross, have no idea what I just said. Also, uh, I think the the home ownership law, foreign home ownership, doesn't apply to corporations. So if you formed a corporation to buy it, you get around the uh, tax. If you structured the corporation in a way to avoid the way the law was written, you're right, Jim. Now, the law says if a foreign corporation owns it, then um, then it, it's subject to the tax. They, they thought they were being smart to beat the workaround, but they didn't beat the workaround. All you do is you make sure it's it's a Canadian-owned comp- company that has publicly traded as a corporation of some sort, or shares are available to be sold outside of the country, and that di- that bypasses the tax. Yeah. They could also lend you the money. One of the other loopholes is, is there was no out for mortgage lending. So uh, Joe buys the house. Um, Bob lends him the money. Bob is Chinese. Joe is uh, Joe is Chinese. Um, Bob, Joe doesn't make his mortgage payment and Bob forecloses on it. That bypasses the tax. So I can bypass, I can bypass the tax in multiple ways because the people who put the tax in, they simply don't know how the real estate market works. They don't know, they don't understand how workarounds can be found. I've always believed when you're going to make a change to something, whether it's foreign buyer tax, whether it is um, the OSFI rule, whether it is the home buyer plan, whether it is uh, rise in interest rates, uh, whether it is a change to legislation. You should always look at how can I, how could someone attack me when I make these changes take place? Have I left any openings for someone to attack me? You don't have a solution until those um, attacks have been thwarted uh, through whatever change you're making. That's how wealthy homeowner clients are not applicable to the OSFI rule. There are loopholes left in the OSFI rule that our members makes it so that our members are not subject to those rules. Now, I am not going to mention what those changes are here on your show. And I don't, we don't even mention to the members. We just tell them to, to go about how to do, to, to do, to bypass them without telling them we're telling them to bypass. Them. Um, I know that's kind of a 
wishy wash answer. But I'm sorry, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not going to go public here with how I can beat the OSFI legally, ethically, and with no problem at all. The OSFI did these rule changes on purpose. Your foreign buyers uh, policy left so many loopholes because they were afraid of so many people. Why are foreign buyers still able to buy Vancouver new homes and not pay foreign buyer tax? Why are foreign owners allowed to own Vancouver homes, get a fantastic tax treatment by the city of Vancouver, lowest taxes in the country? Why are they able to own that, that own that home, make those gains without paying their fair share of Canadian taxes? It just makes no sense at all. And it's one of the reasons why this affordability solution will not be solved by all of these stake players and CMHC trying to come up with newfangled solutions. You need, you need a voice. You need to know how a market works. And my answer is always this, Jim. If you question what I have to say, challenge me. I dare any economist in Canada, CMHC, any banker, any realtor, any financial advisor, I challenge you to challenge me. I do not open my mouth unless I know what I'm talking about. I don't open my mouth unless I can back it up. And that's what the case of the foreign buyers are. Foreign buyer sales were moved forward last year. There was never 10% of sales going to foreign buyers. Go look at the contracts because that's what my answer would be, Jim. You challenge me? Fine. Go look at the contracts. They're, you're going to see that the revised closing date. I know that's how you beat the, that's how you beat the system. Um, all those failed closings that were rumored. Remember all those, remember Jim last year? Oh, there's going to be tons of failed closings because of the implementation of the tax. Well, where did those failed closings go? You had you had literally hundreds of Vancouver homeowners who had sold their houses to foreign buyers, shaking because they and who had subsequently bought another house, shaking because they thought they were going to own two houses because the foreign buyer was going to back out. It didn't happen, did it? Fear mongering doesn't work. Data is solid. Real estate markets are like you're baking a cake. You mix one, you change one ingredient, it's going to impact the cake when it's done. Your, the humidity is higher, you've got to change your temperature that you cook it out of the length of time. That's how accurate a housing market is. A housing art market is not cooking, it's baking. Two totally different things. Ross, thank you so much for your help. Hey, thanks for having me on, Jim. My guest has been home ownership consultant Ross K from the wealthy homeowner.ca. You're listening to HowStreet.com Radio. If you have any questions for the show or our guests, they can be sent to info at HowStreet.com. I'm Jim Goddard. Thanks for listening. Comments made on HowStreet.com Radio are an expression of opinion only and should not be construed in any matter whatsoever as recommendations to buy or sell any financial instrument at any time. Available online at TalkDigitalNetwork.com. HowStreet.com Radio is a production of HowStreet Media Incorporated.